Now we are back from a little cross-country flight over Long Island and we're approaching the New York City area. There's John F. Kennedy straight ahead. And in the next uh, just over 15 minutes, I'd like to show you how to do the approach and landing in the SR-22. First, we need to get off our cruising altitude of 5,000 feet, descending 2,000 feet. And again, I'm still on autopilot using the flight level change mode. Nothing happens. Why is that? Well, the plane is still at 59% power and uh, trying to maintain 151 knots. I need to reduce the power to actually start the descent. You see the plane gets slower. And the autopilot reacts by decreasing pitch, lowering the nose, trying to regain the speed, and that starts our descent. Now, in preparation for landing, we want to switch the fuel selector to the fullest tank. We've been on the right one, so go to the left. First, turn on the boost pump. Always turn on the boost pump before switching fuel tanks. Check that the engine keeps running nicely. It does, so you can turn the boost pump off again for now. Another thing that you want to do when you change altitude, you want to think about your mixture. As you descend, you need to enrich the mixture again. So I'm finding the peak EGT here again with the mixture control. Just go a little on the lean side of that and that prepares me for the descent. You need to do that periodically, especially if you're descending uh, through several thousand feet. Now you can change the range of the map, of course, here on the right side. You've seen that before. There's some other options that I'd like to show you. Display airways, high, low, or none, uh, topography, and of course, some other stuff that you can toggle on. And on the left side, most important probably is the navigation rows down there in the middle, the horizontal situation indicator, and you can switch the CDI, the course deviation indicator between different sources, VOR1, 2, and uh, the GPS. And up here on the top left of the right screen, you can change the frequencies. You always change the standby frequency, the blue one on the left, and then when you click the transfer button, the little arrows, then it switches and becomes active. And you can see that we tuned Teterboro on 108.4. And of course, if you push the NAV button itself, it switches between top and bottom row. You can also change selection down here on the middle display. Now I switch to course and then turning that knob down there will change the course of the CDI. If you just push it, then it switches to center position so you know exactly which way to go to go to Teterboro. In this case, we'll turn left using heading, but of course, we don't want to watch the heading all the time. We'll just use the nav mode, and this will cause the autopilot to switch to VOR in this case because the CDI is on VOR1, and it will turn until it centers the needle again, automatically accounting for wind. Now, Distance to go is set on the DME, but not on this one. We have to switch to PFD and then DME to turn, toggle the display there. And um, the DME that you saw there, so tempting, you can use to switch between NAV1 and NAV2 DME. But uh, I think this is confusing. Now you have VR1 needle, but DME2, uh, NAV2 DME. So we'll switch that back to NAV1. And if we want to see the DME of NAV2, we just use the bearing 2 selection here, shows a nice needle towards the station and also the distance in this case. It's tuned to JFK1 uh, 15.9 on NAV2. You can also you display the bearing 1, of course, but that points in the same direction as the uh, CDI right now. You can switch the altitude units if you fly in Europe between hectopascal and inches and um, there's a standard barrel also to automatically set standard. And here's the wind display. I like uh, option two. Option one shows cross and uh, head tailwind. Option two shows the wind. Uh, it's relatively blowing from the back left at nine knots. So that's convenient. We're coming up on 2000 feet. Altitude select is in white, which means it will automatically capture the altitude. Now it's important to pay attention. If you don't, the plane will just uh, stay at 2,000 feet, but will gradually get slower because the power is still at 34%, and that's not enough to maintain level flight, really. So just before you capture, you want to increase it again, maybe to 55, 60, 65%. That should be enough for safe flight. And you can see we're coming up there between JFK and uh, LaGuardia. 
I'm uh, switching the range to 1.2 miles, or actually 1.2 miles is just that little white circle there. And this gives us a nice indication for our uh, distance from the runway as we do the pattern. You can see there's La Guardia, you can see the runways on the map, and this will help you judge your distance as you get closer to the airport that you want to land at. If you fly downwind, you want to be at about 1.2 miles, maybe tad less for the right uh, spacing to do the pattern nicely. And uh, there's another little thing I like to do to help myself. I'm using heading mode now to keep navigating and I will use the course of the VOR1 to resemble the runway course. It's a runway 20 and so I just uh, turn it to 200 approximately. You want to do this precisely if you do an instrument approach naturally but here for the visual approach I just want it to be approximately the same direction and this will help me judging which way is downwind and crosswind and uh, so on for the base level. Now I'm switching back to engine in preparation for arrival. You want to set the best power point again. Remember finding peak EGT and then going rich 75 degrees Fahrenheit. So we're at 1520 there on the second one. I'm pushing mixture up until it's about 1450. And this of course leans the engine appropriately so that in case of a go around you have full power available to climb out if you have to. In preparation for landing, we also turn on the boost pump again. We do not want uh, the engine to run short of fuel as we are really close to the ground. And there's the airport already in the distance. I'm getting close, I'm still at 2,000 feet. The pattern altitude is usually 1,000 feet above the field, so I want to get down to 1,000 feet. Teterboro is pretty much at sea level. and. Um, I'm setting 1000 here at the altitude selector, even though I turn off the autopilot now. You can do that by hitting the AP button or just use the electric trim and that will automatically disconnect the autopilot and I switch off the flight director manually as well. If you don't fly the flight director, turn it off. It's just confusing otherwise. I still like to set 1000 because uh, that helps me. Uh, it's a nice reference, just like the heading bug when you're flying manually. You can just glance at the display for a second and see where you're supposed to be and um, that helps when flying manually especially by yourself. Descending now I'm uh, back to zero percent power usually you don't want to uh, reduce power too rapidly in these uh, engines because that cools them off but I'm getting close to the airport I need to get down to 1000 and you can uh, drop the flaps to 50% when you're below 150 knots but uh, it's not uh, good airmanship to always deploy flaps at the maximum speed that you can it places undue load on the mechanism so I like to get slower and um, then deploy them right now of course you will see that when I deploy them you see you need to pitch down rapidly to maintain the 1000 feet and it's always good to know some uh, basic power settings uh, for the pattern at 90 knots and uh, flaps 50 percent you need about 30 percent of power so if you know that in advance you can set uh, that power approximately and it will help stabilize things greatly and you can slowly get to your target speed instead of chasing it with uh, rapid power input and uh, yanking it out again getting close to the runway here and uh, going to prepare for my right turn to downwind and another thing I do in preparation for my timing I uh, set the timer up and put my mouse hand over the enter button so I can start it when I'm a beam to time my pattern I'm turning downwind now I did it a little late you will see that in a minute I'm coming out a little close you see that white uh, circle there the runway is already in the white circle so I'm adjusting by going uh, outwards a little bit. Always check the wind when you're in the pattern. It's uh, pushing me in just gently and it's a little tailwind here on, on downwind just uh, as it normally will be because you're of course planning to land against the wind. Checking the threshold there, it's the further runway, it's not the one in the front. It's easy to get confused on airports with the several closely spaced, almost parallel runways. I'm a beam now, I start my timer and I want to run out for 45 seconds if you 
uh, do the geometry on a piece of paper, you will see that at 90 knots you will do about 1.5 miles uh, in a minute. So at uh, the spacing of just over 1.2 miles, uh, we're one minute on the base leg, which means two turns and then 20 seconds of the base leg. And um, also if you fly out for 45 seconds, then you have another 45 seconds as you turn inbound for landing. And um, if you're using the base leg to lose altitude at 500 feet per minute, then it works out pretty well. So we're coming up on 42 seconds. Standard uh, turn at this speed is about 15 degrees back. That's plenty. And I'm reducing power to 20%. And this is the beauty of it. You can just pretty much stay at 20% now for the rest of the approach. Pitching down just slightly, you see about 450, 500 feet per minute. I'm resetting the timer because I want to time 20 seconds on my base leg. But of course, this is a visual maneuver and any flight instructor will tell you to always keep sight of the airport. But uh, still, if you have some basic timing and parameters in your head, then it uh, makes the maneuver just so much more precise. So I'm starting the time again. And of course, checking where the airport is. Um, looks like I'm in a good position. And uh, looking on my map and also at my timing, I know that I have another five seconds to go before I need to turn in. And um, on this pattern, it's always better to be a little early in the turn and a little lower than you should be because uh, going back into the right altitude or adjusting the base or the final turn is easy. But uh, if you lose, uh, need to lose altitude quickly, that becomes uh, hazardous, especially close to the ground. In the turn, I'm dropping flaps to full. Always want to land with flaps full in this airplane. Um, there's really no reason to use less unless you have an emergency and need to glide. See, I'm at 20%. Adjusting plus or minus three four percent to get onto the glide slope. You can see the poppy there on the left side Yes, they're still a little dim, but um, I think they will adjust that in a minute and in the final approach You want to be between 80 and 85 knots uh, depending on the weight and of course uh, Add a little bit of speed maybe half the headwind component um, for you know losing uh, airspeed as a gust takes away the wind and so I want to be at just below 90 knots here on my final approach. Do not uh, yank out the power too early. That will probably lead to a hard landing. Um, on airliners you keep the power in until the very last second. On prop planes you can do it a little earlier. You want to touch down with a low speed just above stalling. But um, I still like to keep my power in just in case and then pull it out here at the end, do the flare, don't hold it off for too long, just get it onto the ground. And remember that as the plane slows down, the rudder loses effectiveness, just below maybe 40, 50 knots, it's greatly diminished and you will need to go back to your toe brakes to steer the SR-22 on the ground and do your little wiggle as you turn off the runway and head towards your parking spot. Now, when you get off the runway, one of the or two things that you need to do while taxiing in, one is uh, turning off the pitot heat and the other is raising the flaps. But uh, don't do that while you're still speeding along. It's easy to lose orientation while you're looking down or uh, trying for the right switch. Make sure that you go straight and you're pretty stabilized, even maybe almost uh, you know, stop for a second. If you want to do that, that's fine. It's always uh, better to be safe uh, and in the way than to run off the taxiway. Here's the pitot heat, turning that off. On the ground, there's not much airflow. It gets really, really hot. So you do not want to run it on the ground. And I'm also raising the flaps. Um, raising the flaps is always a good idea because the propeller might pick up little stones and stuff and uh, slam them into the flaps, especially when there's uh, snow or so on the ground. You don't want that to impinge on the flaps, so getting the flaps up if after landing is good practice. There's really no reason to leave them out. Unless you might have snow on them, then you don't want to damage the mechanism by retracting that uh, against the snow. 
and that would be the only reason to leave them extended. Checking the runway, getting clearance to cross, of course, and um, here I'm using uh, the ground mode on my transponder to stop the altitude replies and um, gunning the throttle a little bit to get across the runway. Uh, I said not to use more, much more than 1000 until you want to get going. And if you have a runway crossing clearance, uh, that is a good reason to get going because you don't want to linger on the runway more than you have to. And also ADC expects you to across that fairly rapidly they may have another plane on approach and if you taxi across like a snail then they will get upset with you and uh, you don't want that now i'm just picking any arbitrary parking spot here there are no dedicated markings at least not in this part here of uh, teterboro airport and maybe right next to that uh, king air is a good spot so i'm turning in and um, fortunately shutting down the sr22 is fairly straight forward. You don't use the ignition key like you would think so. Uh, normally you switch off piston engines by cutting the power to idle and um, of course before you do turn on the parking brake. That's very important and um, I'm turning off the timer here and you can see that I'm turning off the landing light as well and um, as I said, do not use the ignition key, use the mixture. I'm cutting that to idle, or actually to cut off. Turn off the boost pump first, of course, I almost forgot that. And the engine stops. Now the manual says just turn off all switches, so you just do that from right to left. Avionics, alternators, batteries, and the airplane is dormant. Open the door and tell everyone about that great flight that you had.